and thank you for joining in this morning. Um, from wherever you might be, don't miss out. And we're just happy to have you and excited to look into the word of the Lord together this morning. And uh, our scriptural reference uh, comes in from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. Allow me just to pick three texts uh, which we will predicate our thought for this morning. Matthew 14, verse number 34, 35, and 36. I think we will use those. If, if, if time permits, we maybe get to chapter 15, verse 1, but we will just use those three from chapter 14, verse 34, 35, and 36 of the book of Matthew. The Bible says, And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the man of the, that place recognized him, they sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. The good Lord always adds a blessing to the reading of his word. Father, as we look into these things, we plead with you that you imbue us with your Holy Spirit that you may lead and guide us into all truth. Speak now for we, your servants, Lord, are listening. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, maybe before we start, um, allow me to just simply um, voice out my appreciation to those who are from here, Botswana, who keep on uh, texting back and then just giving a, a, a note of encouragement. You are really encouraging me. It's a struggle to wake up at five o'clock in the morning uh, and put on a coat so to preach in the morning. So I'm very much excited to receive your text and then um, and also the prayers that you offer. Thank you for, for all those. And today I also have friends of mine who uh, decided to join in from as far as Uganda uh, and some in Rwanda. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that they are here today. But nevertheless, beloved, I don't have much time. Allow me to just delve in, uh, dive into the word of the Lord as it was read. The book of uh, Matthew today introduces us to a, a scene where Christ um, had just arrived with his disciples into the land. They called it the land of Gennesaret. Now, let's just draw back a bit. If just a few texts uh, uh, from the beginning of the chapter. You you also appreciate that this just happens after the beheading of John the Baptist. By, by Herod Antipas, the same Herod there who, who, who went to his own brother and caused his brother to divorce his wife that he may get the wife himself, all right? Then shortly after that, Jesus then goes on to feed over 5,000 people because it's only recorded that it was 5,000 men, understanding that it was a patriarchal society where only men were counted, all right? So, but scholars suggest that it goes beyond beyond 5,000 to about 25,000 uh, people. And then Jesus then, then separates himself with his disciples and goes on to exclusive place where he goes to pray and be alone and let the disciples go. I don't know how and what there was in, what, what went into their mind when Jesus says, you go ahead, I'll catch up with you. The guy owned no boat. But he tells them, I will catch up with you. You just go. That's where we find out this narrative of Peter and the disciples looking at the waves and looking at how mighty they were. And they got afraid. The Bible lets us know that then Peter looked at and they behold this figure that was walking on top of the water. All right. That was walking on the water. And then, and then, and then Peter said, if it's you, allow me to come to you. You know the narrative. It says that. And Peter walked onto him, and then it, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but, but the Bible lets us know that Peter started sinking, all right? <clears throat> Peter started sinking, sorry. And then Christ immediately stepped in and held him by the hand, and they walked back into the, to the boat. So after all these things, the Bible then introduces or lets us know that then they arrived to a land called the Glend of Gennesaret. And in the land of Gennesaret, when they got there, the Bible lets us know very detailed that the people of the land recognized who Jesus was. They saw the men who were with him and they didn't know who he was. And they went to him and begged him that, ah, let, let us bring people who are sick here. 
that they may only but touch the hem of your garment. And the narrative also concludes to let us know that as many as did touch the hem of Christ were made perfectly well. Now, I just want to indulge you a bit and maybe we, we look into the land of Gennesaret as it is, because there are a few things I want to extrapolate here and share with you this morning, if you may permit my indulgence. Now, the land of Gennesaret, but places like Bethsaida and Capernaum, all right? And it, the land of Gennesaret itself provided from its own leave, from its own uh, fresh springs of water, uh, good water, mineral water, if you may, to the land of Capernaum as well as Bethsaida, all right? So Capern uh, Gennesaret not only provided good water, it also had a good vegetation, so good that it will sustain a vine uh, for 10 months in a year. So for, for 10 months, one will be able to enjoy the fruits of a vine for a whole year, all right? Not only that, it is supposedly believed also that the land of Gennesaret being fertile as it was, it will also have medicinal properties uh, in, in, in terms of the vegetation, in terms of the trees and, 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 and flowers that grew in the land of Gennesaret, all right? Not only that, it is also taught that Gennesaret itself produced so good fruit that they were not permitted to enter Jerusalem during the Passover festivities because it was supposedly thought that people would come to, to eat the food from Gennesaret and, not own, and, then, and then they would not also attend the Passover itself and hence it will lose its value and essence because of the fruit that came or the food that came from Gennesaret. But Gennesaret, what is Gennesaret? Gennesaret is a compound word, all right? Gennesaret is a compound word, which means gen and sarit. Gen means uh, uh, princely and sarit. No, gen means garden and sarit means princely. So a direct translation of that would be uh, uh, garden princely in proper English, of course, it would be a princely garden. So it was named princely garden because of what it produced and what it was. Ah, but now, in verse 35, beloved, the Bible lets us know that as soon as Christ entered this place, the people of the land did recognize him. And they begged from as far as Capernaum and Bethsaida that they should bring people to him. And as many as could touch the hem of his garment were made perfectly well. And Gennesaret was not also too far from the gatherings where we had saw him uh, chasing out demons and they went into a whole flock of pigs. So as many in Gennesaret saw Christ, they were also permitted through the beggings of those who knew Christ to be, that they should but touch the hem of his garment and were made perfectly well. Now, I have a problem having said this uh, before, that if Gennesaret was a princely garden and produced as much as it did, why is it that from its neighbors still there were people who were sick? Why is it that within Gennesaret, with all the medicinal properties that is found within the, the vegetation in which they live, why is it that people still were sick? Why is it that still from Gennesaret, they had to go back from neighbors to bring people to come and receive healing while they could have been sending uh, medicines, sending herbs, sending all the food that is required to build up and make up our immune system. Why is it now in the presence of Christ, all these things are rendered useless? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have many answers to many questions I have, but what I just simply want to know and let you know is that in the presence of Christ, then greener pastures are warranted greener because in the absence of him, many questions then uh, come into play. Were they even greener in the first place? Were they even healing in the first place? Or was it only given a name and hence from the name itself, we supposedly thought it could do that? One may, make, or may, one may be also attempted to ask, but since Christ came, the one who created all these things, since Christ came, the one who made it all possible, then all nature had to bow at the presence of him who created it. Hey, but I want to make a few suggestions before I go uh, and, make, and move forward. That 
Make use of Christ's presence. All right? Make use of Christ's presence like the people in Gena Street. As soon as they saw, they put off as they put aside all that they trusted. They put aside all that they knew. They put aside all witch doctors. They put aside all mutis and all herbs and everything that has been sustaining them. For they found sustenance and they found healing and they found life in Christ. So in the presence of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, make use of of his presence, carry all, not some, everything unto him because of who he is and what he can do. Make use of his presence to a point whereby not only you enjoy the blessings of God, but everybody who is also around you, not only everybody, but inclusive of your enemies as well. Make use of Christ's presence. And also I want to just simply say, Christ is trusted as long as, as much as or as far as he is known. If we therefore perpetuate the truth of God into all the vicissitudes in our surrounding, if we carry it as far as we possibly can, and the truth of who God is, is known by many, not only by us. We get to a point of understanding that now people begin to trust more in God than they trust in anything else. People begin to trust in him and rely on his capabilities because of who he is. And therefore, Christ is trusted as far as he is known. Maybe the reason why we struggle at some point with also bringing friends and family into fellowship together is because to a certain degree, we do not trust God or we don't, we still have an ounce of doubt on who he is. Maybe because the reason why, maybe the reason why we, we, we get to be a bit sluggish in letting him known in every place and calling everybody to him. We still have a tendency of holding on to the pilot's handlebars and we want to pilot the ship at some point. But how many of you know that if you just simply let him be and pilot the ship, this ship itself will reach the shore. This ship itself will reach the bay. It will dock. This ship itself, no matter how strong strong the waves are, no matter how big the waves are, no matter how strong the winds are, it will reach its safe haven. Hey, let me also run quickly to just simply let us know that uh, if we discern much of the day that we are in, if we had discernment of the opportunities that have been praised, that have been placed before us, we will also give ourselves a step into improving the day we live, right? If we look at the the people in gather in in Ganasarit, they made use of the opportunity that they had. They knew that he may not not pass the side again. They knew that he may not come back and visit their land again. And hence, the opportunity placed before them of receiving Christ, not only him, but also his disciples. They brought everything, even unwashed dishes, they brought everything unto the feet of Christ. They made use of the opportunity that is prayed, that is placed before them. Hey, beloved, this just simply gives me an understanding, or rather, when we look into the Bible, in John chapter 1, verse number 10, we get to understand that the people of the land, he, the Christ came to the world, and the world accepted him not. In Luke 19, verse 42, we understand that Christ looked at Jerusalem, and the people of Jerusalem did not even appreciate who Christ was. They left and they remained with their own burdens. They remained with their own challenges. They remained with their own uh, struggles in life. And yet Christ was amongst them. In Ezekiel 2 verse 5, we just simply taught to understand and know that there is a prophet amongst us. That one that has never been, all right, in the person of Jesus Christ himself. Now there are a few submissions that I want to part ways with today because my time is far spent. One is that people uh, who have the people of Gennesaret themselves, they do not rely on their own capabilities and their own strength, their own knowledge for their daily sustenance. But they put all that they had at the mercy of Christ. They gave everything that they have at the mercy of Christ. But what is intriguing is on chapter 15, verse number one, because 
book of Matthew 15, verse number one, the Bible says that, and as soon as all these things were happening, then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus. All right. Their own intention was not to come for healing, but their own intention was to come and, and, and was to come and, 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 and question Christ and what he does. All right. Their own intention was not to come and get themselves unburdened of the problems that they were in in their lives, because even men of God go through life as well. But the Bible in verse 2 let us know that there were, their interest was on the traditions of the elders which they followed, was in the traditions which were set in the whole uh, religious system, the dogmas that they had, that were uh, suppressing people. And they just simply, why do people, your people, uh, transgress the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. You see, and Christ said, why do you tra transgress the tradition of God? Why do you transgress the word of God through your traditions? Now, that's what I don't want to get to that as yet, but I want to get to the point whereby these guys are right. When people are being made perfectly well, when people are receiving healing, when people are being uh, resuscitated from the illnesses that they were in, they left the place not healed of their own problem. They left the place not unburdened of their own uh, laden. They left the place the same way, bitter as they were, as they came. So in other words, this is my point that I want to part ways with you tonight, this morning, is that ah, what happens in the presence of God is primarily dependent on the attitude by which you come, not on the fact that God is omnipresent and omnipotent. Because God can still be like that, and you come with a broken attitude, only not to uh, get healing from him, but to come and test who he is. What happens, therefore, when we approach Christ is primarily dependent on the attitude by which we have come. God is not an ATM still where you just simply punch in the right digits and put in the name of Christ at the end and you receive also a blessing at the end of it. God is God. Even in his silence, he still remains God. God is God. Even if you do not choose to worship him, he remains God. He will cause the stones to, worship, to, to, to give praises unto him. Wake up this morning. Open up your doors. You will hear the birds singing unto God. Without you, God still remains God. Even the heavens go ahead and give glory and praises unto him without your consent. So even if you choose not to worship him, he still remains to be God. What happens, beloved, in the presence of God is primarily dependent on the attitude by which you have come, not on his omnipresence and omniscience. Hey, point number two, I want to just simply submit from the narrative from chapter 14 itself that your proximity to divinity is not a guarantee to eternity. Let me say it slowly. Your proximity to divinity is not a guarantee to eternity. We ought to therefore get to look into these things like look in the life of, of, of Judah, look into the life of Peter. Peter in the presence of Christ started sinking. Yo, Judas, who was feeding with Christ from the same bowl, was the same person who betrayed Christ. Yeah. The same people who are here in this platform as well are the same people who have the proclivity and the tendencies, all right, of also not being faithful unto the same God they proclaim to worship, all right? So your proximity, because you have been a pastor for so many years, it's not a guaranteed fact that you will make it, make it up to your up, up to glory, up to God's places. No, but your selfless, your dying of self on a daily basis gives you the, 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 the gives you a habitation of the Holy Spirit because you cannot be holding on and expecting that Christ also drives. There are no co-pilots in here. It's either he has all of you. Or none of you. Didn't you read the book of Exodus 20, where the Bible just simply says that I am a jealous God and I don't want, don't have any other God before me. Last but not least, my time is up. Last but not least, beloved, I just want to let, let you know that they named the place according to what it offered them. They named the place Genesaret according to what and who was there. They named the place according to who was also prominent at that time. But my question this morning is, what name do you have of God? 
What name do you have of God? Because the name that you have of God tells of the relationship you have with him. For those who have never stuck who have never had a father present, for those of you who have never had a mother present, for those of you who have lost everything, when you just simply call upon his name and you just simply say, our father who art in heaven, he sticks closer than a father that have deserted us, that a father that has passed on. We still have him as a father present in times of desperate need. What name do you have for him? What name? Because the name that you have for him will determine or rather will tell a story of the relationship you have with him. When they were sick and God came through for them, when they were sick and God healed them, they just simply called him Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. When there was nothing and he came through for them, he was just simply God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provided all that they need. What name do you have? For God, because the name you have tells the story of where you come from. I have a lady in whom I'm I'm, I'm, I'm well pleased, if you may. I have a lady whom I, I'm getting married to, all right? I have a lady whom I love. I have a pet name for her, and she calls me also by my pet name. When I'm in the presence of many people, and she just simply calls me by my pet name, not every Jack and Jill will turn to face where the voice is calling. When I call her by her pet name, not every lady who is there will respond because they know we are not friends like that. But the pet name also determines whom you are in relation with, whom you are calling, whom uh, and the type of friendship that you guys have. What name do you have for God? What relationship do you have with God? Or you're just simply window shopping. I beseech thee this morning, beloved, by the mercies of our Father, our God who dwells yonder, who also sent within us our the Holy Spirit to direct us and to lead us into all truth, that we choose to have a friend with him, that we choose to have a father in him, that we choose to have a brother in him, that we lay all our cares at the feet of Christ and let him pilot the sheep until it docks. Let him pilot this plane until it lands. Jesus, Savior, pilot us. This is my urgent prayer this morning. Shall we pray? Father divine, thank you for everybody who has joined in this morning. I don't know why they chose today, and I don't know why they are here today. Many have come, Lord, heavy laden. It is hard to move on in life with a broken spirit. It is hard, Lord, to do anything, Lord, with a heart that is heavily laden. Pain of losing friendship, depressions and all. It is hard, Lord, to do anything in this world when we are not of sound mind. That is why, Lord, I just want to pray for them at this juncture. And I pray that you give them a special dispensation of blessing and your Holy Spirit as well. To comfort as it is the duty of the Holy Spirit. To comfort and give reasons as to why all these things are happening. I pray in a very special way, Father, that you may forgive us still where we continue to do wrong. Forgive us also from our presumptuous sin. But when you have done all these things, Lord, may you keep us safe within your own fold. Keep us safe, Lord, from the darts of the evil one. Grow your word in us. Where I have made a mistake today, I plead for forgiveness. But where everything was done right, may all the glory and honor be given unto you, Lord. Because you are God and you shall forevermore be God. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen.